Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. If you look around us in this country, you can see the weaponization of our agencies, weaponization of our own government against us. You look back at January 6th, you see the arrests of people. You see that they're setting a precedent, which is saying that if you come out and protest, if you come out and try to uh, exercise your constitutional rights to voice your opinion publicly, we're going to find ways of shutting you down. We're going to find ways of kicking a door in at 6 a.m. and arresting you. We're experiencing I, I, what I really believe the early stages and maybe even the middle stages, not, not necessarily the late, thank goodness, but the early to middle stages of a communist overthrow. We're seeing our country fall into tyranny. And so joining us today is Professor David Clements, someone who's been on the front lines of exposing this tyranny, fighting against it in his own personal life, and who had also he has recently released a documentary called Let My People Go, which is highly, highly censored, which means it's going to be pretty good. And I'll make sure that we actually upload the video to this channel. He gave me permission to do that. So we'll make sure that the video is also on the Man in America Rumble channel so you can watch it for free the documentary Let My People Go. So this is just going to be a, a soulful conversation about where our country is currently at, where it's going, how we can affect change to, to, to you know, hopefully change what's going to happen in November to alter the course of, of our country, uh, because right now it's headed in a very precarious place. So folks, please enjoy the interview with Professor David Clements. David, it is always good to speak with you. It's been a long time. I hope you're doing well. You're beard is getting more and more impressive with every encounter we have. And thank you for being here, man. Well, Seth, it's great to be with you. Um, yeah, you know, game recognizes game when it comes to the beard and, and you're also doing very, very well. Um, I've been told that, uh, there's some people that have found the fountain of youth. I am not one of those people, but, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the compliment. I'll take it. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're someone that's always been involved on the front lines with a lot of different things, uh, you know, and it, you're constantly not just having your finger on the pulse, but you're actually involved in a lot of action, uh, especially as it relates to election integrity uh, and January 6th. And so I know that you've recently released with some other folks a documentary, Let My People Go, which will be really the, 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 one of the main focal points of today's discussion. Uh, and I'll go ahead and bring up the, the website, just let my people go dot movie. And, uh, you've actually very kindly given me permission to upload this directly to my rumble channel. So as soon as, uh, you know, we finish with this and once people watch this video, I'll make sure that the, uh, the actual documentary is available on the channel to watch, uh, because it's, it's the idea that get as many people to watch it as possible. It's not behind some paywall somewhere. It, it's much greater than that. So let's just go ahead and, and just dive right in because there's a lot of relevant news for us to talk about the arresting of people actually we've got um i'll pull up really quickly here <clears throat> we had you know and here's at huff puffington post election conspiracy theorist attorney arrested after a dominion defamation hearing so uh, stephanie lambert uh, who is you know says has uh, you know for years played a key role in trump allies efforts to spread cons conspiracy theories about voter fraud sounds like a hero in my book uh, was arrested so we're, we're seeing, whether it's this January 6th, you know, what's happening to Trump, we're seeing the weaponization of the agencies, the government agencies against uh, we the people and against the people, especially like folks like you and me that are fighting against this uh, really you know, co you know, communist overthrow of our country. Uh, so a lot of this is very topical right now. So I guess I'll just hand it over to you. And, and where do you want to start? I'll let you guide the discussion. Well, you, you brought up the arrest of Stephanie Lambert, and really, um, I didn't realize that the film would be so relevant to what so many are going on. I mean, we, we, there's a portion of the film where we deal with weaponization, and as most people know, Peter Navarro had to turn himself into prison. He was one of the first and foremost, quote-unquote, election deniers. Stephanie Lambert um, was arrested by U.S. Marshals in a federal courtroom in Washington, D.C., um, and if you just read between the lines, uh, there was a major release or a quote unquote leak. I don't think it's a leak, but she handed over, um, a cache of email correspondence between the, uh, Dominion representatives 
and election workers that highlights just the myriad of, uh, of crimes that are being committed. And that was sealed under protective order. But when she saw that there was evidence of crimes, she gave it to uh, Sheriff Darleaf out of Barry County. And uh, at that point, I think the, uh, the Dominion folks were going after Sheriff Leaf. And I think in an act of self-preservation, he not only uh, provided that evidence to Jim Jordan in Congress, but he put it on X. And there's this huge tranche, about 2,000 plus emails that highlights uh, modem configurations, the fact that these machines are wide open on, on the internet, and the use of integrated software, which is something that we've covered uh, that's been actively denied by by election reps. So you've you've got that, and um, so the 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 relevance is is kind of just painful that um, you have to take a look at what depths um, corrupted judiciaries will go to 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 persecute investigators. And um, the reason why this is really really um, important is that. There was a special prosecutor appointed by Dana Nessel. Most people know that Dana Nessel is a very, very corrupt attorney general in Michigan. And um, she wanted to persecute a political opponent, that being Matt DiPerno, who ran for AG against her. Well, she farmed out this case to um, a, pro- a prosecutor by the name of DJ Hilson in Muskegon. And if that rings a bell, there was a big breaking story last summer where in Muskegon, you had a clerk, all kinds of whistleblowers coming forth. That during the 2020 election, they found tens of thousands of fraudulent ballots, uh, guns, silencers. And in this jurisdiction, DJ Hilson didn't charge one person, didn't investigate, didn't pursue it. He's the recipient of the charge to go after Matt DiPerno and Stephanie Lambert. Uh, I happen to represent Jeff Lenberg, who's a nation state vulnerability expert that tested many of the systems that cost, that, that caught uh, thousands of votes being switched from. Trump to Biden in Antrim County, Michigan, and there have been attempts to turn him state's witness, give him immunity deal. So it's a very, very complex web where everyone is kind of on on sinking sand, and we're all just hoping and praying that we'll we'll get some justice come November uh, to uh, reform. I guess is probably the best way to put it. A lot of these these corrupted institutions. When you take a step back from this, which I think is really important because whether it's you know, in my own life or watching you know, d- different events unfold, you know, the saying you can't see the forest through the trees, it's sometimes very hard for us to see where we're actually at and see how far things have changed. It's almost like if you say you have a, a nephew that's three years old and you don't see them for six months. You see them later. It's like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you. And you're, you've grown so much and you've changed all these ways. Yet the parent, because the parent sees that every day, the parent doesn't see the same changes. Like for them, they're just seeing uh, this child grow and, and, um, and change every day incrementally. And I think that, that that same analogy can be applied to the state of our country that we, and I think in a lot of ways, forget what life was like, say, 10 years ago, let alone 50 or 100 or 200 years ago, we, we, we've forgotten what that is. And I think it's made it difficult for us to look objectively at where our country is at. And so that's an important thing because I think that for us to not be aware of the actual state of our country is that in and of itself can be weaponized and used against us and, and be used to slowly push things uh, you know, beyond what we would have ever accepted because it seems so incremental. And so from your perspective, where is our country at? And where is, especially with the, the legal system and, and the weaponization of these agencies against our own people, uh, how would you describe to say, say someone you know, in 50 years, they're saying, you know, you're sitting down rocking on a, on a front porch somewhere watching the sunset and says, someone says, you know, great grandpa David, uh, tell us what, what was happening in America in 2024. How would you describe where this country is at in terms of the corruption, in terms of the overreach, and in terms of, of how tyrannical our government is or isn't right now? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. I think it's um, when, when you were framing the question, uh, I started thinking of Solzhenitsyn and uh, the Gulag Archipelago, and he dedicates the first 
section of his book to arrests. And um, then I think of the J6ers. And you've had 1,250 plus families that have been devastated, uh, doors kicked in, an absolute um, denial of due process, uh, fundamental case law precedents that have been ignored, like Brady versus Maryland, where you're entitled to all exculpatory evidence that, that tends to prove your innocence. And the only reason why we're finding out that the story isn't quite what we've been told is through, um, you know, brave actions from a Tucker Carlson. Uh, it's not to say that a lot of this footage didn't exist. It was just, uh, you know, held under lock and key. And it, it took someone like Tucker with his, his broad audience to give you a different version of events with uh, Jacob Chansley, for instance. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm reminded that this past January 6th, this is the third year, some of our J6ers, these are U.S. citizens, are still being locked away, many of which have not been tried. So Jake Lang, three years, three months, still incarcerated, no trial, never went in the Capitol. Uh, Ryan Samsel, over three years. In Actually, uh, David, your audio cut out. I'm not sure. Is that is it something on your end, perhaps? Uh, testing. Is it? Oh, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, yeah, those are three concrete examples. There are many, many more. But this past January 6th, three doors were kicked in and, and more people were added to the ranks. And, and when you read the Gulag Archipelago, at first, you know, you see the sophistication of the communists uh, and how they go about elaborate designs to ensnare people and just take them. Many of our fellow American citizens are taken at six o'clock in the morning at dawn raids with the FBI. And so um, I can put the book aside and, and I don't have to, to wonder what it was like in the Soviet Union. I can just open my eyes and take a look at what's going on in this country. And the fact that you've got someone like Peter Navarro that's going to be serving four months in prison for not waiving executive privilege that he had to raise. In fact, it's really the president's privilege to waive. And he stood on longstanding precedent as an advisor to President Trump. The fact that even during his appeal, he's likely going to have to serve the, the full weight of that sentence. So even if he's proven right later, they have already gotten their pound of flesh. So um, I think to succinctly answer your question, I would say that our country's unrecognizable. And, and, and one of the reasons why I've gotten involved in election integrity, and some people would say that I'm an expert now. I was not an expert in November uh, of, of 2020. I had to investigate and learn and ask questions and re-examine the evidence and admit when we had a, a wrong framework. And, and sometimes you have to put forth a hypothesis. And the reason why that you can be wrong is that so much information about subversions being withheld, so many public records that we need to analyze, um, we've you know, the only reason why we got them is because we've had whistleblowers um, provide this, this vital information. Um, but it was really J6, and it was really the false flag that took place there. And I can say with confidence it was a false flag because I used to work in a courthouse just about every day for, for the better part of 10 years. And we had to participate in active shooter trainings. Um, you actually had to do like role-playing uh, uh, trainings with sheriffs and judges on what do we do if this happens? What do we do if this happens? And everything that I saw in January 6 was reminiscent of active shooter trainings, but on steroids, the resources. And uh, you've got people like Clay Higgins that have said that, look, we, we've got information that shows that hundreds of embedded uh, you know, Fed informants were working in the crowd. And one of the things that, that has become very, very clear to me, Seth, that the most incendiary video of people doing damage to the Capitol, um, those people aren't indicted. So basically, you've got someone that's bashing a window. You find out we don't have any justice there. That person's not being remanded into custody. But an unwitting Trump patriot that's right next to them, they're the ones that are thrown into custody. And... Um, 
Folks, perhaps you'd agree with me when I say that over the past five years, the mainstream healthcare system's credibility has plummeted. Alternative healthcare systems that aren't beholden to medical consensus or big pharma are on the rise. Sweetamine is time-tested and proven to boost your life with better health. It's one of the leading products that helps with inflammation and daily aches and pains. Just because you get older, it doesn't mean that you have to feel old. And folks, did you know that most of the diseases that make people sick and die these days are rooted in chronic inflammation? oftentimes due to glycine deficiency. So sweet amine is composed mainly of the amino acid glycine, the nutrient that the immune system uses to regulate inflammation. So with once daily sweet amine, most people feel the reduction in pain after just a few days. So I challenge you to the 12-day sweet amine challenge to fight inflammation and take control of your health today. So folks, buy sweet amine online at sweetamine.com or call 855-GET-SWEET. That's 855-438- 7933 and make sure you use promo code Seth S E T H to get a nice discount on your purchase. You've got this this huge battle between two narratives, right? And the propagandist really has to resort to the same thing over and over. It's just repetition. It's like a feed that's being right into your head that uh, the election's safe and secure and people that question elections are domestic terrorists. And um and I guess I could I could uh, and my thoughts with a, a personal observation, or at least a personal experience, is that my life personally has been upended um, to the point where if you Google my name or if you go to Wikipedia, uh, everything that I've labored uh, to, to create from getting a doctorate to teaching at a university um, really doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I've got friends and family that are patriots, but outside of a very tight knit community, uh, you know, I'm, I'm toxic. And, and so you just take a look at this, like, this is never something that I would have contemplated, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s and thinking I'm going to go to school. I'm going to marry my wife. I'm going to have children. And to, to, to think my shelf life in this country, um, November is really important. To me. <laughs> if, if we don't get the right president, that's going to issue pardons for the J sixers. Um, you know, we're getting picked off one by one and I'm not being melodramatic at all. I mean, literally we've got people in this movement that are being taken into custody at an alarming rate. And, um, certainly not something that I thought was possible being on the other side of law enforcement for a long time. I, I, I oversaw six law enforcement agencies. I used to approve every felony case that would come through Lincoln County. Um, I knew who the good guys were. I thought I did. And um, many of the people that I talk to now that are still in law enforcement, I, I take them as evidence. And their response, Seth, is usually something like this. Well, what do you expect me to do, Dan? The, the Department of Homeland Security has badges, too. They have guns. Like, they've never con confronted a scenario where uh, the enemy wasn't a drug dealer or a murderer. It was actually a different segment of the U.S. government. It's a tricky place. To be, and I'm glad you mentioned Solzhenitsyn because I, I feel like there's so many lessons in history that we need to look at to understand where we're at, and and it, it's a really, it's a very I, th I think profound and wise perspective to go back to that story because that's something I I feel like that you know where we're at, and most of the audience that's watching this show at least I feel like they know where we're at. But most Americans, unfortunately, I don't believe know where we're at, and if you look at you know the um, Soviet Union and, and the the overthrow of you know bringing communism in, or you look at uh, Mao's Red Guard and, and China, they at the at the early stages they didn't imagine that they that there'd be tens of millions killed. They didn't imagine that they'd be in labor camps or in gulags. They didn't see that. But I think that's the that's the important message for us to understand is that. They hate us. They, you know, these these creatures that are, you know, you know, right now going through this process of trying to, to kind of overthrow America, but also the world and bring in this system where they have complete control and, and complete dominion over this realm. They hate us. They they would love to see half of Americans dead. They'd love to see half of Americans in labor camps. I mean, that's that's just that's what we're up against. That's their plan. If they if they 
succeed. And, and that's what drives me to do what I'm doing. I'm sure that's a lot of what drives you to do what you're doing is that when you see that future, there's nothing that can't be sacrificed in the present to try to prevent that future from happening. Because I know you have children, I have children, I have a newborn, and, and I, I cannot allow myself to say that I, I sat by and did nothing uh, when when this was happening. Now, thankfully, we have our Second Amendment, we have our Constitution, we have a lot of resistance, we have a lot of tools that the that the Russians did not have to protect themselves. They had fire pokers, right? Axes and fire pokers. You know, if if the Russians were armed like the Americans are armed, the Soviet Union probably never would have taken power, right? They never probably would have never you know kind of emerged that way. So, with all that being said, and looking at the situation uh, right now, you, you mentioned you know this this upcoming election, which I I, I really. I really believe that it's the most important election we've ever had in America. Uh, I, th- I think that if we, we won't survive another four years uh, of what we've experienced because it, it's, it, I think it would dispel the end. I'm surprised that we're actually even where we are right now after four years, that we're still standing, or not four years, however many years we've been under this administration. So looking at the the corruption that you've seen the the control the the electronic voting machines the corrupt ags uh the uh, just this this infrastructure this deep state infrastructure that's controlling all these systems and mechanisms that are the very mechanisms and systems that we would need to use to correct the course for this country how do you see come november how do you see that we have even have a chance uh of of, of, make, of, of changing something and, and hopefully preventing that future that we're, we've been discussing? Yeah, there's a, I think the answer is uh, twofold. Um, one is a, a spiritual prescription that I think is just as important as, a, as the naturalistic one. Um, and we spend far more time on war gaming. How do we combat rigged systems? But um, the, the problem, Seth, is that the human heart um, of many of the tyrants that are there, uh, you've got people that are ideologically possessed. And so you can't appeal to their, their reason. You, you can't have a rational discussion. And, um, and so you, you have to ask yourself, what do tyrants respond to? What have they responded to in history? And it's always been um, a show of force, not a show of violence, but a show of force where you think of the 1960s civil rights movement where people are locking arms, getting sprayed by water cannons. Um, uh, crying out for equality. This is the greatest civil rights battle of our time and probably uh, since Lincoln's uh, civil war. And uh, I don't think there's any hyperbole. It's just that it's actually more pernicious because it's harder to see the slaves uh, or or the the slavers chains that are fixed to us because they're invisible because uh, we've bought into this political theater that our elections more or less work. And um, when we say that the deep state is is part and parcel of the elections, we're not making this up. You've got DHS. They've got a sub-agency called CISA. And CISA works with the Center for Internet Security, an unregulated uh, private entity with no congressional oversight. They receive all of their policy guidance by the Atlantic Council, a New World Order Marxist globalist regime that is responsible for deploying Albert sensors. These are computers that reside behind our county and precinct firewalls that allows our federal government that hates Trump, that hates us, to monitor election data real time. And then you also have the emergence of third-party corporate vendors in all of our states using internet-connected software that allows them to modify that election data. That means inflating voter rolls. Um, that means not complying with with national critical infrastructure guidelines and laws that are on the books. They don't care. They are absolutely flagrant in the ways that they're violating the Help America Vote Act, um, the, the the Voter Registration Act, and FISMA. Um, so it's in this landscape that we're trying to wake people up. But the other part of the problem is that the Atlantic Council also informs CIS's uh, guidance on censorship. And Mike Benz did this incredible interview with, with Tucker Carlson showing the absolute operational control of, of big tech uh, and shutting things down through backdoor uh, cloud-based uh, uh, meeting rooms like Jira, um, where 
22 million plus posts were taken down in the months leading up to 2020 on Twitter alone. And the post covered um, negative talk about early voting, negative talk about vote tabulation machines, and uh, negative talk about mail-in ballots. If you started putting out anything critical on those three things, um, things were, were banned. Now, if you go to Facebook, Google, YouTube, you're not talking about 22, 22 million posts. You're talking about hundreds of millions of posts or people being outright, outright banned or deplatformed. So I think it's curious now that the prescription to fix our elections, uh, it being embraced by Republicans and conservative Inc. is let's embrace mail-in ballots. Let's embrace early vote. Let's embrace all the things that uh, the deep state was censoring. And so it's like almost in order to, to create a, an, an economic place where you can survive and not be banned, uh, many people that know better are giving prescriptions that will most certainly uh, rob us of a fair election. And, and so um, spiritual prescription, I think that we need to have a call for a national day of repentance. This is something that's featured in the film. And, and before people think like that's, that's crazy. Um, maybe it is, but it was good enough for Lincoln. And what do I mean by this? Uh, the emancipation proclamation, most people remember. Um, but four months later, uh, when our country was hanging on by a thread, um, Lincoln issued a, another proclamation for a national day of repentance. And if you actually read it, it is just the most Bible saturated, amazing, heartfelt, like I couldn't believe politicians wrote this proclamation and something happened um, within 18 months. You had miraculous convergence of votes that if you've ever seen the film Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis, it really does a great job showing how unlikely that vote that led to the 13th Amendment was. And I think that was spiritual work. I actually think that was uh, the American people through their national leadership meeting the conditions set forth in second chronicles where if we just pray out repent god will heal our land and um, I, i'm not a theological scholar but um, I, I have been taught in bible study that god's character does not change so i, I think that his conditions won't change uh, so i think that we're gonna we're gonna need our national leaders not the usurpers not the bidens of the world but uh the trumps the Kerry lakes the people that were actually robbed of their legitimate victories need to set forth a very solemn day. So that's prescription number one. And then we have to start piercing and fighting back against this propaganda feed that's, that's lifting up faulty prescriptions. A lot of people are focusing on, let's just out harvest the Democrats. And they've bought into this premise that if we just have enough Republican volunteers scouring trash cans at nursing homes or at college dorm rooms and really, really embrace a, a shoe leather ethic that we're going to beat Democrats this time. And what they don't understand is that's not how the Democrats are beating us. They're actually embracing wholesale illegality through the creation of fraudulent and fake ballots. And uh, so when you vote early, what does it do? It actually gives you uh, data points to create a PID control algorithm. And the more information that you have, the more variables you can account for and that month leading up to election day, the easier it is to fine tune that algorithm and get your paper trail. So um, you can figure out how many people have uh, received an absentee ballot. You've got software that tells you exactly what the delta is from Democrats versus Republicans. And on election day, we've got electronic poll books that are configured and set up to the internet where you get real time tallies of who's shown up. And that actually gives ballot yields, the metrics they need to strategically go to specific drop boxes with concrete numbers uh, for a, a selected candidate. And so this is all about understanding that the rig software optimizes the environment, gives you all the data that you need, and then mules can uh, create those fake fraudulent ballots to have a paper trail that more or less matches. And um, it's not like you've you got to have, you know, workrooms of Democrats filling out ballots. That's not what I mean. In Arizona, for instance, when the audit team in Maricopa got hold of the physical ballots, I said, there was about 1,600 boxes, all but 50, the seals were broken. 
And uh, Dominion use a, uses a specific paper in Arizona that has to use. It comes from the Roland Paper uh, Group. It's about four times thicker than regular uh, paper. And when they started analyzing that paper, they found that none of it came from the Roland Paper uh, paper group. It came from Office Max, Staples. It was ordinary computer print paper. And the reason why this is important is that that Roland Paper Company also had an infrared, um, basically, tag it that was part of the, the ballot. And you've got a configuration in the Dominion machines. It's supposed to catch any piece of paper that goes through and doesn't have that, that watermark. And um, so when the tech experts started looking at the configurations of the machines, it was turned off, meaning it was not, it was not set up in a way to check for counterfeit ballots. And so when you had this massive headline out of Maricopa, uh, don't worry, uh, the numbers matched. Folks, how do you feel? Me, I feel great. And one of the reasons I believe I feel better is because I take Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies in a capsule. They have an amazing story how this product was developed by Dr. Douglas Howard. It's right there on their website. Balance of Nature receives over a thousand success stories every single month. They have hundreds of thousands of customers who've purchased billions of capsules of their fruits and veggies over the past 20 years. You should check it all out on their website. Their products are gluten-free and non-GMO, and they contain no added sugars or synthetics. I think if you're looking for something to make you feel better naturally, you should definitely give Balance of Nature a try. In fact, order today. Whether you order online or call them direct, you must use the promo code SETH, that's S-E-T-H, to get this special offer of 35% off, plus $10 off any additional sets, plus free shipping, and the money-back guarantee. So call them at 800-2468-751 and use discount code SETH or order online at balanceofnature.com and use discount code SETH to get 35% off. Well, it's really easy to have your numbers match when there's no chain of custody, when the paper doesn't come from the official paper company, and your configurations are turned off to not catch counterfeit ballots. Uh, So that's one example, like, okay, Republicans, what is your answer for that? And then another example that we actually bring up in the film is the testimony of Jesse Morgan. He was a subcontractor for the U.S. Postal Service, and he was perplexed at why he was driving completely filled out ballots from Bethpage, New York to Pennsylvania in 24 super big boxes. So you're coming hundreds of thousands of pre-filled ballots. Now, the significance of his testimony was that he drove those ballots during early voting. So when you understand that you have integrated internet connected software that shows you that that the tallies for absentee ballots that were requested, you can now find a PDF file, Xerox it onto to, to paper and just print it on high speed printers. And then to the tune of 200,000 plus ballots, ship them across state lines and inject them in Pennsylvania's elections. Now, uh, there was an investigation. Jesse Morgan was found to be credible. The U.S. Postal Service had to admit it through a, an official investigation that this happened. And so those are the instances of, okay, the data, the machine subversion informs how you go about getting that paper and inserting it into the system. And unless Conservative Inc., the RNC, or you know the Trump campaign are serious about confronting those issues, What you're going to find is uh, a slow walking of the vote. Everyone's going to stop counting in the middle of the night while more mail-in ballots just find their way through our tabulators. And um, what we've endeavored to do in Let My People Go is to break down everything that I've just told you, Seth, in excruciatingly clear, granular detail of every subversion point, input to output in our elections, not with potential Um, issues. We give you actual evidence at every stage. And and that's why we we really want this film uh, in in your hands. And one of the the biggest issues that we've dealt with is censorship. This is the most censored film in America. When we launched uh, on December 15th, uh, we had a distributed denial of service hack against our servers that overwhelmed them. Um, America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, was hit with a $148 million verdict uh, from Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. They are featured in the film. They're actually featured in animated fashion because we actually do a propaganda trailer and they're included. 
our largest promoter said we can't risk promoting this film because of what happened to Rudy. Um, the IRS sent me a bill for tens of thousands of dollars the day before Christmas, just out of, out of the blue after the launch. Um, our DVD packaging company canceled us. Our credit card company not only canceled us, but seized hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when we basically course corrected saying, okay, I'm not going to get money back for this film. I'm not going to be able to replenish my life savings. Uh, if anything, this is going to drive me to the poorhouse. We thought we've just got to give the, we've got to give this film away. We've got to treat this like we're running Bibles be- behind communist lines. And it's because we, we, we talk about the DHS's role and we talk about how these vendors are doing this. That makes it so dangerous. It's, it's, it's the reason why a film like 2000 mules can survive because they don't talk about machines. Um, and this film won't see the light of day without your help. One, one question that comes to me just in hearing you and, and also knowing you and, and, and having spoken to you many, many times, I know that you've had to sacrifice a lot and this has thrown your life, which was probably quite comfortable before. You had a very respectable career. You could have probably retired by now and, and just been you know, sipping cappuccinos, watching the sunrise uh, in the mountains of, of Colorado, wherever you might, you might have found yourself. What's been, has there been one central thing, whether it's a, a, a thought or an idea or a gut feeling that's driving you? What's driving you? What's, what's telling you, I can't stop? What's telling you, when you're up against risk, like like what happened with the release of this documentary, where you probably lost a lot of money that you'll never see, uh, you know, come back to you because of these corrupt system. Uh, what it, what is it that's pushing you forward? That was saying I won't stop because of this. Um, one of the things is that when I was a prosecutor, I actually had to constantly tell victims, please don't lose your nerve. Like you got really bad people that either abused you in domestic violence cases or they attempted to murder you. And your, your, your case is only as strong as the courage of your victim. And uh, so you, you, whether, whether you felt confidence, right, you had to fake it till you make it. <laughs> it's like, please don't give up. Please don't give up. We need to get rid of this bad person that's hurting the community. And so I, I think I've been hardwired over the years. To just, you know, you take on bullies, number one. Um, but number two, I, I just, I've come to the realization, Seth, that the reason that I see the way that I see or the way that you see, because you're ahead of the curve and like God in his infinite mercy has given revelation to people. And, and I don't, I don't mean that this has got to be some wild, like voice of God stuff. I'm saying that there's an intuition. Um, uh, there's a gentle whisper where you're seeing and paying attention to things that when I look around the country, I'm like, why can't you see this? This is clear as day. And, and I, I believe that God is awakening shepherds. And if we meet that condition that I talked about with Lincoln, I visualize this. And again, I, I'm, I'm not a theologian, but I, I, I just get this picture of like God almighty sitting on the throne. And we pray the, our father, we, we pray our, our, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I know that right now, when I look around and look at Joe Biden, nothing in this earth looks like what I think heaven is like, but I I see meeting his conditions and that moving him from the throne room, walking over to uh, the judgment seat in the courtroom. And I I think it's like having a judge with a gavel that renders a verdict and it slams down. What you get is instantaneous revelation to the millions of sheep that don't see or didn't see what I saw on November 3rd, 2020. Again, it's not because I'm brilliant. It's not because I was a professor. I just think that God um, has handpicked tens of thousands of people throughout the country to see, whether it's Peter McCullough on the uh, COVID stuff, whether it's Tom Renz on lawsuits that he was dealing with, everyone's kind of got their lane. And it's really great when you meet all these people. It's like, man, God knew exactly what he was going to use you for at uh, you you're you're filling a void uh for corrupt institutions that the press is supposed to to, to deal with right like you you've you filled a void uh where you're more trustworthy than the mainstream news and so i i just see this evidence of so many people that i think are being 
uh, effectively shaped by the Holy Spirit. And, um, and if you're not a believer, I think it, you could call it your conscience or, or intuition. I, I happen to be a, a professing Christian. And so I, I think what drives me is that I'm more afraid of being judged by history than my colleagues. I'm more afraid of what the history books will write about this time period and what my family will think of me than, um, you know, people that were signing my paychecks. And I think it's as simple as that. And the people that haven't joined our ranks um, are beholden to a pension. They're beholden to like, I just like wisdom for the, for the world is self-preservation. It's, I, I just want to keep my stuff. And um, at some point, like every conversation I was having during the lockdowns or with mandates or with, with doctors that were complicit in the poisoning of, of people that I knew. I'm like, I don't want to be around these people. I don't want to talk to them. Like it's, it's killing my soul. And um, I think taking my first stand, which got me on Tucker Carlson, which got me on war room, which got me on, uh, you know, cyber symposium, all these little things that I wasn't planning on were really just day by day exercises and obedience that, all right, I, you know, we'll see what you're going to contribute to changing the fortune of this country. But it's not like you have this grand plan, like I'm going to go and be this election integrity guy, or I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And this video is going to go viral. It's like, no, I'm scared right now. And I'm going to risk my job by, by telling off my university president. And I'm going to do that today. And that exercise is going to yield consequences that are going to hurt my family, but they also might yield opportunities to find other like-minded courageous people. And, and so I, I'm all about trying to make, uh, the conflict and the persecution smaller and more manageable. And like each day it's like, okay, Lord, what would you have me do today? Um, how can I be obedient with one task today and just do it to the best of my ability? And then what you find is that over a course of a year, you might have 365 days of like, I call it good tape. It's like being coach <laughs> and um, people start to stand out. And there's so many people that I partner with that don't have my platform, don't have your platform. I'm like, they are grinding away towards the truth. And um, so there's, there's the article of faith and in, in entering into this landscape spiritually and uh, not knowing uh, how things are going to shake out. And then you partner that with the fact that you do see fruit. And if I didn't see any fruit, I wouldn't get up and keep doing this. But like everywhere I go, I'm like, there's a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough. And you just, you just try to persevere. I'm glad you went back to just the overall spiritual nature of this as I think it was your first prescription, right? And I, and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, and that's what it is for me, <clears throat> pardon me as well, is just that I, I just feel like this is what I came here to do. And it might change, right? Uh, it's like I didn't come here to be some podcaster. I came here to fight in this war because I, I think it's greater than the war for freedom in America. It's greater than the war for uh, protecting like, against this, you know, you know, new world order and this great reset. It's, it's, it's a war for the souls. Like that's what I really think that we're experiencing right now is that there's, there's, there's two sides to this. There's the good and there's the evil, and they're both, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, fighting and and allowing us to play out this fight. And it's really at the end of the day, you know, how many souls are on each side, uh, whenever that day comes, and and I feel like that's what what this is. Um, so, but once, so I have a, just a question, it's more just, just an extrapolation of, of your knowledge and, and, and looking into the future. So if you look back at 2020 uh, and how they got away with stealing that election, I, I would say that in many ways they, they pulled all the stops. They had the mules, they had the, they had the machines, they had, uh, like they had so many things, but they also, they had the propaganda, which I really believe that it's the tools of propaganda that allow them to get away with it. If Fox News, as an example, if, they, if that one media organization was not complicit and was not actually just another arm of the deep state, I don't think they would have gotten away with stealing the election. Because ultimately, you know, you, as you mentioned, what, the, what they fear is a showing of force. They, they fear us standing you know, with arms locked. I think that's one of the reasons why they've used January 6th as this 
false flag and the psychological operation because it makes us scared about coming out again for a, a protest. It makes us worried. I don't want to be one of those people that ends up getting locked away for doing this, right? Folks, I have a quick message for you. Look, the 2024 election is do or die for the globalists and communists that have infiltrated our country and are currently running it. And they either have to win or they're going to destroy America so nothing is left either way. And if you're the person that's watching this show and following this information, unfortunately, you have the weight on your shoulders of making sure that your family is prepared, especially as we head into this next year and this next election cycle. Because unfortunately, I think it's going to get rough. And one of the ways I know they're going to target us is through our food supply. You can see all the food factories burned down. You can see the warnings of coming famines and food shortages and everything like that. And food is one of the number one ways totalitarian regimes have always used to control the population is destroy the food supply. So if you don't have at least two, three, four, five, six months worth of stored food, I highly recommend you take that very seriously. Because look, as I mentioned, if you're the person that's watching this, you're the person that carries the burden of making sure your family is prepared. I would recommend at least six months, if not a year, of storable food. So if things go haywire, whether it's grid down or terrorist attack from what's coming across the border, that your family can safely stay in place and you can feed your family. So folks, today, go to heavensharvest.com and make sure you get your storable food that'll last for up to 25 years. Just in case things go south, you know that you have what's going to take to feed your family, which is so, so critical for us to get through this next stage of history. So go to heavensharvest.com today, order your food that will last up to 25 years, and use promo code SETH to save 15% on your entire order. Again, that's heavensharvest.com and use promo code SETH, S-E-T-H, to save 15% on your entire order. So they fear us coming out in mass. Now, what is it that leads to people coming out en masse? It's the spread of information. It's enough people seeing, wow, this is really unjust. This is going against the Constitution. This is, they stole this election. It's enough people getting that information that then allows them to do that. This is why information is really one of the greatest weapons and the greatest threats to a totalitarian regime. Like, the, look at the Great Firewall in China. Because if enough of their people... <clears throat> see through and see that they're being ruled by evil totalitarians, they will rise up. And so if you look at 2020, I really, I really believe that what allowed them to steal that election fundamentally was it because they were able to control the narrative that hit the mainstream to the degree that they did through censorship on Twitter, Facebook, you know, Google, Google's role, even the mainstream media. And if they didn't have those tools, even if they were able to do everything else, they would not have been successful because people like yourself, the information put out that exposed that theft, because there's always evidence in a crime. And, and, and the key is controlling the, <clears throat> the, the spread of the evidence, right? So looking at 2024, as far as I can see right now, it seems like Twitter will be a platform that will be able to discuss election fraud. Actually, Elon Musk is now becoming some, you know, uh, you know, far right conspiracy theorist talking about these things, which is great because you look at I'll see a post he puts out that's exposing something about you know, immigrants or corruption, even election stuff. It'll get 30, 40 million views. It's fantastic. So if you look at the role of Twitter, you look at the role of other places like Rumble, which was not nearly you know, the, the, the size that it is right now back in 2020. You look at even the shift in the media landscape, landscape, you look at how massive the Epoch Times has gotten now versus four years, you know, three, four years ago. You look at the collapse in viewership of CNN and these other propaganda outlets. If you look at all that, do you still think that they'll be able to successfully steal the election in 2024, even if the mechanisms are in place? Do you think they'll be able to cover it up? Or how do you see things playing out? Because I, to me, no doubtly, they will try to steal it. And maybe they even have the mechanisms in place to do so. But the public is in such a different place now. Even the, the overall support for the Democratic Party is, has plummeted. So how do you see things playing out? Yeah, I, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think that we're going to lose. I wake up every day with an abiding conviction, like fully believing we're going to win. And, um, but I have to be careful in my messaging 
uh, from a standpoint of advocacy because um, you know people have it's it's how do I put this delicately without offending certain people? Um, let's just put it this way: I've got a very very uh, strong curiosity about uh, devolution, Q, anonymous, critical researchers, all those things. Like. And if you've been awakened and you're asking questions and you're exercising critical thinking, great. But where I get heartburn is when we um, get sucked into a passive posture where we don't see that we need to meet Trump in the middle. Uh, We don't have to accept the status quo and um, the machines that are there and start just submitting to this idea, well, maybe the fraud will just be so overwhelming because Biden's so fundamentally unpopular that, um, you know, well, you know, it's like, we'll overwhelm the algorithm, all these things. And that's all possible. I'm not saying, I'm not discounting any of it, but if you really want to improve your chances, there are things that you can do to create massive fissures and cracks in a fraudulent system. And, and so that's why we talk about voting on election day, same day. That's why we talk about showing up 300 strong in 3000 plus counties every two weeks saying, You've got defective products here. Um, you're certifying that machine for use, and that's a yes or no vote. You can actually say, no, I'm not going to certify something that I, that I strongly believe, based on the evidence, facilitates fraud. Um, canvassing boards that certify these election results after election, they don't have to certify those tallies if they haven't examined critical records that are being withheld from them, like cash vote record summaries. And, and so... I, I guess, Seth, what I want to see from the American people over the next eight months is a posture of the of an abolitionist. Um, like you just have to see these machines for what they are, and they are tools of a modern day slave trade. And when you know that fraud enters any equation, I don't care what your election code says, I don't care what the law says. If fraud enters the equation, and in most instances, any reading of the common law case law, tens of thousands of case, fraud renders certain transactions null and void. They, they render coerced plea deals null and void. And when you see that these, these machines actually facilitate fraud in the execution, um, apply the same principles of law to that scenario, and we shouldn't be abiding by anything that these election codes say if this is true. And it's, it's, and I think we've carried the day that we're not warning of potential vulnerabilities at this point. It's like the mountains of evidence are so exhausted that uh, our fight isn't substantive engagement. Like no one has refuted one substantive point that we put out in audit reports that are hundreds of pages long, footnoted uh, with, with top level experts. It's gaslighting. It's destroying someone's name because they voice a counter narrative. Um, so I believe that right now you're looking at a time where Trump has never been more popular. He has not only coalesced his base. I think people that uh, were on the fence about him are completely seeing him in a new way. I think the uh, minority communities, the black community, he's a, he's a hip hop icon. Um, I think that you're seeing that suburban housewives in Texas that are seeing the border invasion are saying, give us back the guy that talked about the wall. And then you counter that with the the most unpopular political specimen that anyone has ever seen in Joe Biden. And, And the one metric that you used to be able to believe in and take to the bank was voter enthusiasm. All of that was thrown away post 2020. Uh, not just in Trump's election, but in Kerry Lake and Katie Hobbs' election, where you had someone hiding in a bathroom for crying out loud that didn't take the debate stage. Then we're told she beat this person that's made for the camera, made to articulate uh, concepts in just uh, painstaking clarity. And um, I think the other thing that I'll leave you with, Seth, is that we found one another. Like the experts, like we were all kind of in triage mode, like, do you know about these machines? Do you understand these systems? And for the first year, it was like, okay, that's garbage. That's crap. That person's a faker. That person's a grifter. We don't have that problem. Um, almost instantaneously, if we see a defect in the system, we know exactly who to contact. 
we get a diagnosis and we're catching things within 24 hours uh, that we weren't able to do. And so the, the, the beauty about the truth is that um, if it's on your side, it will continue to build and, and, and manifest itself. Uh, so the, the court of public opinion, as I've put it, um, is being dominated, absolutely dominated by um, people like myself, many others, not because we're brilliant, just because we happen to be telling you the truth. And the only thing that the that team evil has at their disposal is two things. It's the propaganda snake news media to slander and try to destroy your name and a cage. And now they are migrating from the propaganda tools to the cage because they're scared. And so I think you're going to see over the next eight months, things get more chaotic. I mean, for crying out loud, you, uh, Trump can't even uh, post bond for his appeal. He's looked with 30 different sureties where he's got to come up with hundreds of millions of dollars just to appeal what was clearly a witch hunt against him. Like if you can't see the environment that you live in right now, God help you. Um, so I, I don't know if there's going to be a black swan event. I don't know any of those things. All I want is clear thinking where it's like, okay, I want to make the problem small. I don't want to have to convince the entire legislature. I don't want to have to uh, convince an unaccountable judge. I want to look my clerk in the eye and say that your oath dictates that you can't certify that black box because you don't know the faintest clue about how it works. And then I want to talk about that three to five member board of, of supervisors that, that certify the vote saying you can't certify this. We have to bring it down to that level and pack these rooms and actually start acting like we, the people, like we've got this noble agency that's our birthright as Americans. And as soon as we, we tap into that, this whole charade falls apart. Um, but as long as we keep putting our hopes in a lawsuit, in an outcome, in a person, we're going to continue to tread water. Well, such good points. David, if folks want to support you, how can they do that? Uh, do what Seth's going to do. Um, upload the film. Put it everywhere. Um, find a Rumble link. Support uh, Seth's channel. We actually want this to be uh, something that... Uh, we just, we just know that the only way that I'm going to get my life back is if we solve the problem. I mean, make no mistake about it. And uh, basically, the last three years have been condensed into this film to, to give you clarity. Um, so upload it, share it. If you've got an email list, send it to everyone you know. If you've got a text list, send it to everyone you know. And, um, and start showing up to local meetings. And then the last thing that I'll say, because it's, it's never far from my thoughts, is Find a J6 family that lives in your community or your state and see them through month to month. Uh, I, I never bring up organizations that spend your money for you, but we do a prayer call uh, every night on the prisoner's record on Telegram. It's one of the few places where we can go that's not censored and start asking questions from the admins. They're like, hey, is there a family in New York? Is there a family that, uh, that you know of that you can send us some information? And we will direct you to families that you can learn more about. Um, and make sure that they can pay their mortgage and put food on the table. Because right now, the, this weaponized DOJ has created uh, their, their state-created orphans and widows. And if you want to see the sign of a healthy church, it's it's a body of Christ that serves the orphan and the widow. And there are so many families out there, Seth, that um, have either been scooped up and terrorized. But don't forget, there's a million more families that haven't had the doors kicked in, and every night they wonder. Am I next? And so, um, the most encouraging stories that I have for me, for me and my family, aren't like what I've got in the bank. It's like what gives me courage is to see people that have it far worse than I do, and they're still fighting. And uh, so, right now, I think the currency is courage. And so, uh, help help me out by showing courage in your local community, uh, taking care of a J six family, and then the easiest thing to do is to share the film where we can. And we'll make it easy for people to do. So we'll have the, in the description below this, we'll have a link to the, where it's up on Rumble, a link to your website, but I'll also put in the description a link where people can download it. Because you know, anybody can go open a Rumble account, a BitChute account, a 
a YouTube account even. You try it on there, see how long it lasts. Uh, you yeah. can download it, upload it, get just get it everywhere. And then, I remember actually, my, my, yeah, my, my YouTube uh, video is still there. Uh, you can't find it unless you've got the link, but there's a context thing. But uh, YouTube's fertile soil, but um, we want this. We, I'm giving express permission. So for folks that are worried about copyright protection, you could even upload and burn them on, on uh, DVDs. If you want to support us, you can financially purchase DVDs at frankspeech.com. But even there, I don't care if you don't have the resources and you want to rip DVDs and, and hand them out or put them on USB cards. Um, that's perfectly fine. Like uh, We are just desperate because I want to tell you this. I'll, I'll end with this, Seth, is that the shelf life of the film ends in November. I mean, it'll be a nice historical, you know, tip of the hat to a time period that was very, very, um, you know, an important juncture in, in, in our nation's history. But the film, it really is going to have no relevance after November. So I, we need help. We really do. Well, if not now, then when? And if not us, then who? So, David, it's it's always a pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate everything that you're doing. I appreciate you and what you stand for. And thank you again for uh, giving us this time today. And I hope that the people that are watching and listening can, at a minimum, share the, the video, upload it somewhere, share this interview. Uh, that, that's, that's the easiest thing that can be done that can actually have the greatest uh, impact. So, uh, David, thank you again. Thank you, Seth. Great to be with you. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I've now got a very important about 30-minute update on the banking situation. So now even Jerome Powell is coming out and saying, folks, the banks are going to start collapsing. Uh, he's talking about it. He's uh, in line with a, a massive major real estate CEO that's saying the exact same thing. So they're now speaking openly about what's coming, which is what we've been warning you about. So folks, please enjoy the interview with Dr. Kirk Elliott. Kirk, it's good to see you as usual. How's it going? Uh, it's going great. It's so good to see you too. Yeah, there's always updates. And I was at, you know, when we first started doing weekly shows together, I thought, gosh, is there really going to be a, a weekly thing to focus on? But I feel like we could almost do twice a week or something. We'd still have so much content because it just seems like there's everything's compounding now and everything is speeding up, which I mean, look, this is an election year. There's a lot of really significant events that are unfolding. And I think that most people would agree that this isn't just in a normal election year. And this is, like, in, in, in a lot of ways, I'd say this is the time for Hail Marys from the deep state. Because if the, you know, the, the populist vote for Trump is enough to get him in and enough to overwhelm their systems and all of that, it, it spells a, a very big loss for them, right? So they're, I think they're in desperation mode. And we, you know, as you know, and I know, the economy and finance, everything controls. It's it's like the underlying pulse of the entire world. That's why you know, folks like Martin Armstrong can predict wars based upon just looking at financial numbers. So understanding how finance plays into what's happening this year is really important. So uh, let's, uh, you know. Last, you know, one of the more recent interviews we did, we talked about March 11th with the, the pullback of the emergency funding. Uh, we know that there, uh, as we talked about, you know, CNN saying, oh, you know, uh, I think New York Community Bank, people pulled out seven or $8 billion, like, oh, it's not a bank run. And it just seems like there's everything is kind of boiling and that they're trying so hard to keep it, you know, keep the lid on, but they can only do that for so long. So what, what are you seeing on your end over the past week or so? What are some of the big stories that you're seeing unfolding? There's so many. I mean, and, and you're right, boy, we could we could almost fill up a show every single day with all the economic news that's happening right now. But so the biggest story of the year financially, I think, is unfolding right underneath our nose and it hasn't really happened yet. But that's FDIC running out of money. I think we are going to have bank failures on steroids. That, that makes Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, you know, First Republic, when that all happened last spring, um, it's going to make that look like child's play. I mean, that's really what I think. This is going to be the biggest financial story of the year. And here, here's the reason why. So, so first you look at why do banks fail? They simply have more withdrawals and they have deposits. They run out of capital and the investments that they have aren't growing, right? Because banks invest in the same things you and I do. 
right? They invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate companies, except on a larger scale because they're working with other people's money. So when their investments are coming down, more withdrawals and deposits, they're going to run out of capital. So this is why you had those five banks that failed back in March, April of, of last year. So now, do we have the same thing going on now? Yep. But why did those bank failures stop? You know, everyone said, whoa, look what the Fed did. Fed's amazing. They stopped the bank runs. You know, they they put a they didn't fix anything, though. They put a Band-Aid on it, but there's still, for sake of illustration, a big, huge gaping wound underneath the Band-Aid. They never fixed that. All they did was put a Band-Aid on it by instituting the bank temp funding program, which was stimulus money to bail out failing banks to stop the bank runs because they know that people lose confidence in the banks, they they lose confidence in the whole financial system, right? So, so that's what that did. But then peculiar is turn of events. They they expire that on March 11th. It's sunset. It's done, right? Which is what a week and a half ago. So now, what does that mean? That means banks that are going to fail, they're going to be allowed to fail and go into FDIC receivership. It's like, why in the world would they want a bank to fail during an election year? Right. So it's it's either one of two things as I kind of think about it. Number one, they realize they truly have kind of run out of money. <laughs> you know, they can't continue to print with the emergence of the BRICS nations taking away the petrodollar. There's no built-in demand for our currency. So any funding that they might need that's not being paid for by our taxpaying dollars, they have to print it. And they know that if they keep printing, inflation goes up, they have to keep raising rates. And that's that's detrimental to the economy. So, so either they realize they're there and they just can't simply do it, or B, they want the banks to fail. Say, like, Kirk, why would they want the banks to fail? Well, because they have a different agenda. They have a central bank digital currency that takes away our ability to buy and sell with whom we want to, where we want to, when we want to, and for what, right? So that's all about people control. I don't care if you're an ultra leftist or an ultra right person. Nobody would want the ability to buy or sell taken away from them. Nobody wants spyware put on their bank account. And, you know, let's look at it this way. If Trump were the president right now, the left would be saying, I don't want him telling me what I can buy or sell. And just like people on the right are saying, I don't want Biden telling me what we can buy or sell. Doesn't matter what political persuasion you are, right? Nobody's going to want that. So therefore, if nobody wants it, how are they going to get us to adapt it peacefully and actually want it? Well, you create a crisis that's so bad, you know, banks failing, can't feed your kids, can't pay your mortgage, can't pay your rent, can't pay your utilities, you know, just exhaust people with bad stuff. And then they'll say, please, government, fix it. Please fix it. And they'll say, yeah, we have a solution. It's called central bank digital currency. Here you go. It's not going to fix anything. But what did they just do? They want to instill something that's going to put com complete people control on you. and then. The government is acting like God in the sense of they want to be our protector and they want to be our provider. That's what God is in our lives. Well, they want that. So how do you make that happen? You cut off private capital. You cut off the banking system. So people just simply do an end run around banks and go directly to the government for their survival and, and money, right? So, so this is what I think that they want now. Back in January of 23, before the bank crisis even started happening, I was I was looking back the, earlier this week and I saw, man, I was talking about FDIC in January of 2023, only having 1.7% of all deposits covered. Right? And I talked about that on, on numerous shows, but I was talking to David and Stacey Wider at Flyover Conservatives. And it's like, we did that show back in January of 23. So... Then Basically what happened? meaning, sorry, just is that let's just say that there's you know, a, a trillion dollars that people have sitting in the bank. 
everyone thinks that, oh, they go to their local bank and it says FDIC insured. Everyone's seen that plaque and you think, oh, okay, well, up to a quarter million dollars I'm insured. But if the whole system goes down, the FDIC would have to have a trillion dollars yeah. you know, in simple, simpleton math to insure everything. So what you're saying is that back in January of 23, of all of the money sitting in the banking system that they were supposed to be insuring, they only had enough funds to insure, to actually pay out on what, 1.4%. Is that? 1.7%. 1.7%. Okay. Yeah. So, so imagine this, if one bank failed, okay, you start to whittle away at that 1.7%. If two banks fail, you keep whittling away at it. So, so I got to thinking, what actually happened here? We had five banks that failed, Silicon Valley, Signature Bank, Credit Suisse, First Republic, and Silvergate Bank, right? Five. So then what happened between March of last year when that happened and March of this year? Well, I looked. You go to the FDIC, you can look at their balance sheet, you see what their assets are. They now only have 0.74% covering all deposits, savings accounts, checking accounts, CDs in America. It's like, What? 0.74%. So those five bank failures whittled away more than half of their assets in one year. So now, if we go into bank failure mode, because they just stopped the emergency funding provision, so now banks aren't going to get that to avoid FDIC receivership, they're going to go into FDIC receivership if they start to fail. That's going to whittle away the money. Now, I was reading some articles. Um, on Yahoo Finance, there is a CEO of a big real estate company. Um, and I'm assuming probably some commercial real estate, like building subdivision, some, some big dog to be able to speak on at this level. He warns that 500 or more banks are going to fail or be consolidated over the next two years. 500. Okay. Let's just say that he's the dumbest guy on the planet when it comes to this stuff. And only 10 banks fail, not 500. He's like so far off. Well, that's still double the amount that failed last spring. I think FDIC could go under, especially if it's 500 banks, FDIC goes out of business. But let's not take his word for it because he's just a CEO of a real estate company. Let's go to the bank banker of all bankers, supposedly the smartest banker in the world. Let's go to oh. Jerome Powell. <laughs> Chairman of the Federal Reserve, right? So what did he say this week? He said there will be bank failures caused by commercial real estate losses. It's like, wait a second. He's he's in charge of all the banks, right? And now he's saying, I, we're going to have bank failures. He's basically saying the system that they created is failing and it's going to fail. So he should be the biggest cheerleader for his system and he said, well, commercial real estate is going to cause banks to go under. So therefore, you've got this real estate guy, the banker of all bankers, both all saying banks are going to fail. We took away more than half of FDIC's assets with the five regional banks that failed last year. This one is going to be bigger than that. It's going to be way more than that. And I think this is why this is the biggest story of the year is bank failures are probably going to cause FDIC to go bankrupt. Well, now what? If you saw a bank that was failing and it hit the news, it's like Bank X is going out of business. What are you going to do? As a, as in, what's it going to do to your brain? You're going to think, oh, my word. If that bank failed, what about my bank? I wonder if the money's safe in my bank. And this is why you start to have bank runs is because Everyone gets squirrely. They don't want their money to go away. They don't know how big the contagion is. And you start to get a run on banks. And it's like that scene on It's a Wonderful Life, right? Where they go in there and it's like, sorry, we don't have any money. It's like, what? What do you mean you don't have any money? Well, we don't have any money. We were investing your money into everything that you're investing in and it's gone, right? We're just hoping and praying that not everybody wants their money out at the same time. That's the nature of fractional reserve banking is they only have to keep a certain amount on hand. And, and during COVID, that amount was zero. Of course, you can have bank failures if it's zero. So then just recently with Basel III, the international banking accord that, that they signed, they're bumping that up to 20%. 
So it's like, okay, this will stop bank failures. It's like, will it? Will it? So they moved it to 20%. Let's just say you were a billion dollar bank, Seth. You're the president of a billion dollar bank and you were used to having 0% on hand and now you have to come up with 200 million because 20% of a billion is 200 million. Where's that money going to come from? It's not growing on trees, right? So, So you have to somehow come up with 200 million. If you can't, you either fail, go into FDIC receivership because you're out of compliance or you get bought out by a bigger bank. So this is what's going to start happening is because of these mechanisms that are supposed to help banks stay afloat, they're going to kill banks. But I think this is by design, right? I, so at a conference, I think it was last year, I was talking to RFK Jr. And, you know, the, the guy, you know, his family is embroiled in controversy and, and conspiracy theories for <laughs> since the beginning of time. With his uncle and his dad, you know, being mysteriously killed. And it's like, so he, he understands conspiracies. And he said, Kirk, what we're seeing in America right now is no longer a conspiracy theory. It's just a conspiracy against us. So I'm telling you, the theories of yesterday or the realities of today, when these things are spoken about, they're not hiding in the shadows. They're telling us they want to usher in central bank digital currency that has the ability to cut you off from buying or selling. They're telling us all of this. It's not a conspiracy theory. They're in plain sight telling us what's going to happen. But again, nobody would want that unless the crisis is so bad that they're willing to give up their freedoms, right? So so this is where we're, we're headed. And then yesterday, I'm, I'm watching Jerome Powell, you know, give his FOMC, you know, speech. And what did they do? They decided to pause interest rates. Again, no shocker to me, even though six months ago they said, we're going to lower interest rates like six times in 2024 because we've won the war against inflation and we can lower rates now because we've done our job. I told people back then that's not going to happen. They haven't won the war on inflation at all, right? So, So therefore, you can't lower interest rates if inflation is still persisting or inflation gets worse. So what are they doing? They're not raising interest rates because they know that would actually kill the economy. They're not lowering because that would make inflation more. So they're just putting it on pause. It's like, ah, we don't know what to do at this point. Let's just pause. So now the message is changing from we're going to have six interest rate reductions this year to then he said maybe two or three. And then they left it on the table. But and this is a big but core inflation is persisting. It's getting a lot. And we would be open to, you know, possibly not having any interest rate reductions this year at all. It's like, okay, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to fix it is what all of this tells me, which is why he's saying banks are going to fail, right? And, And you look at this and it's like, this is complete madness, complete madness, because the system that they created is, is now like, the dinosaurs on Jurassic Park. You know, you create this beast, this monster for everybody to look at and go to the park and enjoy it. It's like, wow, look at these dinosaurs. And then the design dinosaurs decide to escape and they start destroying their creator. This is what they've done with inflation. They can't fix the beast of their own creation. They can't fix it. It's gotten too big. It's gotten too bad. It's gotten too ugly. And it permeates every part of our lives. And now you just probably just let the system fail so you can usher in something new. And that something new is all about people control. Sadly, that's how I view the economy headed this year. And it's crazy because just just to put together a simple timeline, right? It was you know, we, you know I've been talking about the banking system for quite some time now. So yeah. the bank failures of last year, we had five banks. I think those banks were uh, you know, close to half a, tr- uh, half a trillion dollars, if I remember correctly. In assets like you know five hundred billion or something, um, I think it was that. Wait, let me see. Uh, I had it here right in front of me. Um, the yeah, so uh, the the four regional banks, including Silicon Valley Bank, had five hundred thirty two billion dollars in assets. Yeah. So basically, we had these banks failed last year. They put in this emergency, you know, safeguard. Is this kind of okay? The the dam is leaking. Shove something in the biggest hole and hope it holds out. But there's a there's a one year time limit roughly on that safeguard, which just came off. 
Okay, so but those four banks, just those four banks alone, took over half of the FDIC reserves, right, to bail out these banks, or not really bail out the banks, but actually to to insure the funders. So I put up a picture earlier. This is a picture from this is Silicon Valley Bank. These are people waiting outside the bank as it's failing, hoping they can get their life savings. So when you and I have conversation and we talk about, you know, we talk about, uh, sorry, so when you and I have these conversations and we talk about what happens when, the, you know, there, there's a bank failure, it's like, this is what it looks like. If, if, I mean, you can't really see closely, but you zoom in on these, these different people. Like these are people, they might have half a million dollars. They might have $10,000, whatever it is. They might have their life savings. They might have their, their business account, whatever it is at that account and or it, within Silicon Valley Bank. And they're sitting there. I can't imagine the stress that they're experiencing, hoping that they can walk into that account and walk away with a check that represents the, the money they had in that account. I, I mean, it's you know, similar to the, the scene from It's a Wonderful Life when everyone goes in all at once and that there's that big, you know, kind of big ruckus and they're, they're just like, they're all screaming like, I want my money out. And he's like, I can't, I can't pay you all. So you have basically with, with where the situation is at now, it's like, okay, so we had the, the, the emergency funding put in place that just got pulled out. In the meantime, as you mentioned, they're now saying, okay, Hey, you got to have 20%, not 0%. Okay. At the same time, you've got the, the regional banks that are being warned about, like so these smaller banks, you got Powell coming out, you have significant people, this real estate CEO, even Powell himself coming out admitting that, that this is coming. And you, you don't you don't have you don't have Powell coming out, you don't have Yellen coming out and saying, Hey folks, just so you know, uh, we know that you trust the FDIC, but actually the FDIC can only cover less than one percent of all deposits. I, yeah. I mean, it, to me, it's like that that dam that they are trying so hard, or maybe they're not trying, maybe they're intentionally like building it up so the whole thing collapses because it's an election year. I mean, that's something that, I mean, what do you think about that idea that had, as we head into the, you know, I, what I think is the most important election uh, in the history of this country in terms of determining whether in four years or three years we're a communist country or the, the, the free United States of America, I mean, the timing of all this is just insane. I, I mean, I, it just, it's just, it's baffling. It's, it's all kind of compounding. It's just, it's teetering on this edge. It is. And so it's not just here that we're having an election year. It's like 60% of the world is having an election this year. So what do people vote on when they go to the ballots? What do they do? They're voting to change the government. Right. That's what all elections are about. They want to change the government. So this year is no different. Are we going to change or are we going to stay down this fateful path on the road to serfdom? Right. I think that that we'll see. Right. But I think most of America is starting to wake up to the fact of the government overreach. And this is why the battle against Trump, for example, is so extreme. Even Christine Lagarde in, in Europe is saying, Boy, if Trump wins, dude, this is going to be really bad for the globalist movement. It's like, sweet. See, they know it. They know that that people are waking up and this populist movement is waking up and the government overreach by these globalists has gotten so extreme that it's almost like it's exposed, right? And so the manipulation is exposed. The lies have been exposed. And here's what I love about that. Just like anything in life, um, if something is hidden, it can control you. So let's just say you're a politician, you have skeletons in the closet, right? So you can, that can always be used against you. Another politician is going to say, hey, <laughs> I'm going to expose the skeletons in your closet unless you vote my way, right? And so, so you get that. Um, or like, it, you know, if you're, if you're a Christian or whatever, and it's like, okay, you've got this hidden sin, right? It's like, okay, once it's exposed, the one who's trying to control you, no longer has power, right? If things are out in the open, there's no power. If the politician were to just go out and say, these are all my skeletons in my closet, that can never be used against him for, for you know, it's out there in the open. And once, you know, you, you confess your sins, for example, well, then 
in, in the Christian world that, okay, the devil no longer has a grip on you because it's all up in the open. So this is what I think is happening in, in the political world is all of these things, these, these things that have been hidden for years, they're all becoming truth is being exposed. The lies are being exposed. Truth is overriding that. Light is casting out the darkness. People are waking up to the fact of what's been happening. And this is why I think the globalist, the, why the battle is so intense right now, because the battle is no longer in the desert. The invading army is right at the gates of the city, ready to overtake it, right? And that's why this battle is so extreme and why it's exciting to me because truth is going to win. I fully believe that. Fully believe that that, that light is casting out the darkness. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy road to get there, right? But I think that we're we're getting there. And and you look at everything, the price manipulation in silver over the decades. It's now being exposed, and you're seeing massive movements in in the price of gold and silver. You're seeing things being exposed politically and economically. Um, the FDIC underinsured, and people realize I, I have to run for safety. I maybe I'm just going to get my money out of the bank. Well, that's what you should do, right? That would be a partial solution, not a full solution. Partial solution: get your money out of the bank. Second part of the solution, I would allocate into tangible assets like silver because still staying in cash, well, how do you get your assets out of the bank? What are you going to do with it, right? So you have to do something with it. I wouldn't put it in the stock market. I wouldn't put it in the bond market right now. They're over overvalued because the stock market's a function of revenue. People don't have money right now. They're not spending. Unemployment's going up. This is another lie that's being exposed from the, the Biden administration is they said earlier in the week, 275,000 jobs were created. Created. Okay, this is great, right? But then they said, but an unemployment went up to 3.9%. It's like, wait a second. How do you create 275,000 jobs and unemployment goes up? Shouldn't that be the opposite? I mean, but but something's wrong with that math, right? But or is it? No, there, there's nothing wrong with the math. There's wrong with the how they speak it and the messaging, because in America, the way that they measure unemployment is if you've been looking for a job for so long that you you got so discouraged and you stopped looking because nobody's hiring you, they take you out of the pool. They take you out. They don't even measure you anymore. It's as if they now consider you employed. Because you voluntarily stopped looking for work. Does that mean you're employed? No. It means you're still unemployed. You just gave up. Right? So, so that's how what we're seeing is those people are not working. They don't count them anymore. You add those to the number of people in unemployment, and everything that they're saying is multiplicatively worse than what they're saying. And so this is the economy that we're living in. And I, I like it that the more lies that they say, the more people distrust what they're saying because their their wallets are telling them this can't be true. It's not my reality. And that's where we're headed now in this election year. And hopefully people see the truth as it starts to cast out the lies. So one question I do have for you is because I, I agree with you in terms of trying to pull assets out of the banking system, but I'm sure you have a bank account. I have a bank account. I have a savings account. So, you know, because for a lot of us, you know, we, we, you know, maybe you pay your mortgage through your bank. Maybe you have to, you know, your uh, paycheck every month from your, your employer comes into a bank account. So, you know, we have to still have bank accounts. So obviously, whatever assets you can comfortably pull out and put into, whether it's cash under the pillow, hey, that's a great step. The next step is going to be assets that aren't going to be tied to any particular fiat currency like the dollar, right? Which is, you know, tangible assets like gold, silver, ammunition, food, water, yeah. land, et cetera. Um, but what I see one question I do see that people ask a lot, which I think would be very useful to get your advice on this, is what kind of bank would you recommend people using, right? So yeah. would you say, you know, hey, go for one of the really big banks, like, you know, say Bank of America or Chase? Would you go for a small local bank, a medium sized bank, or say a credit yeah. union? Because if we have to have money within the banking system for just interacting in society, 
what is the, I guess, what is the, the least bad option of those particular options in your opinion? So good question. Um, I wouldn't do the big banks, you know, the big five, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, City, Wells Fargo. I mean, they have so much derivative set. They've got tens of trillions of dollars each of derivatives debt exposure. That's not safe. I also wouldn't do a small little local one-off bank because I don't think they have enough capital to withstand a storm. Now, we're seeing regional bank failures, but all those regional bank failures that we're seeing are like coastal regional banks or maybe commercial real estate, residential real estate is causing them to hit the skids. So overall, I think credit unions are the safest. It's kind of a dangerous comment to make because I haven't looked at the books of every single credit union, right? None of them really, but but the way that they're owned is they're owned by the members. Um, so they're going to be a little bit more conservative in their approach or else they'd have a mutiny on their hand if, if something went wrong because of the way that they're owned. Um, and I think regional banks um, in the Midwest are probably pretty okay because they don't have the extremes in real estate valuations that you've seen on the coasts, right? So, so really credit unions, or medium-sized regional banks, but really in, in the flyover states, right? In, in the center of the country. Um, overall, I would say that's probably good. Now, my CEO, Ashley, and I have this conversation every single day because we're a big company. We're getting millions of dollars a day coming in in bank wires for people buying gold and silver. And so what do we do? Do we have that all in one bank? We can't. So we're, we're finding regional banks here in Colorado and basically spreading it out between a bunch of different banks. I would encourage everybody to do the same. If you've got more than the FDIC limit in your banks, open up a second one, open up a third one, go to a credit union, do what you need to do, but don't have too much in cash. Now, we can't eliminate all cash. We, you just can't because we live in a cash world. We have to have an emergency fund. We have expenses. We have to live, right? So, so But having too little in cash affects your peace of mind. Having too much in cash is counterproductive because you're not keeping up with inflation. But maybe three to six months of expenses in cash is good enough. And then I would allocate the rest into something that's strong, like silver, that's actually growing and thriving and takes advantage of, of the markets. It, it maintains your freedom, your privacy, because you're getting it out of that system into something that's tangible and real. So everybody's different, though. That's why we we do free consultations, so we can hear your needs, your fears, your goals, and and map out a strategy for success moving forward using precious metals as a hedge against your banking assets and other assets that you might have. That makes sense. So one thing I will say, and just as we kind of wrap up here, you and I have talked a lot about Weiss ratings. Uh, I'll put this link in the description. This is a great place. I've even looked, when I've been looking for banks, this is a great place of, of telling you the health of the bank. Obviously, it says, yes, JP Morgan is, is a B, you know, City, City Bank is a B minus because they have so many assets, right? So that, that, yeah. that does give them some amount of stability. And they're not looking here at, they're not, they're not analyzing how likely the bank is to impose globalist agendas, right? So let's just say for folks that are on here, let's just say you want to come on here and look for just a, you know, whatever community bank, right? You type in your bank name. And say you're in Longview, Texas, or say you're in Lexington, Tennessee, and there's a local community bank, well, you can see it's a D plus. So you can find your bank on here. It shows you the total deposits, shows you the net income, the capital, the assets, return on assets. So it this it has a whole analysis on it. So um, this is something I would definitely recommend for people. This has been really helpful for me. If you're going to say, hey, is the local credit union safe? Well, you, you go find your uh, your, your local credit union, say you're banking with the Union Fidelity Federal Credit Union in Houston, Texas, looks pretty healthy, right? You know, it's a B. So that's just something um, I would recommend. And then finally, if folks do want to move and reallocate into precious metals, uh, we've got a link set up, uh, Gold with Seth. You come on to here, it takes you to the website with, with Kirk, who I, I trust infinitely um, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons little uh, form here that folks can fill out to set up a, a free consultation, or they can give you a call 720-605-3900. And I know that, you, you know, you guys can walk them through any and every question. It's free. 
to, you know, whether they say, hey, what about this one retirement account I have? How can I avoid taxes doing this? You know, should I store it at home? Should I store any question at all uh, about, you know, should I buy 10 ounce bars or one ounce, you know, rounds? Whatever it is, I know that your specialists are an extension of your knowledge and they will help people. So all those links are going to be in the description. Kirk, thank you again. It's, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, any final closing comments for people as we sign off? No, just don't operate out of fear, right? Just operate out of wisdom, sound mind. This makes sense, right? Don't, don't, fear will cause you to make a wrong decision to put your head in the sand and do nothing. But listen to what Seth and I were talking about today. That's just wisdom, right? It's wisdom to get out of something that's coming down as soon as you can, get into something that's going up as soon as you can. That's how you can maximize your your return while minimizing your risk. So just take that leap of faith and and give us a call and we'll walk you through it. And either you can say, yeah, that makes sense or no, I don't want to do it. It's fine. Our goal is to help you come to a decision, whatever it is, to help you protect and preserve and start to minimize that financial anxiety that you have. Perfect. Kirk, thank you again. I'll see you next week. My pleasure.